All right, the Penn Live Penn State Blitz is back for another week of talk about the Nittany Lions. We are joined this week by a special guest. You're, you'll see him in a bit. I'm Greg Pickle. We're going to start with first down. Optimism grows around the return of college football. We'll get into some news and notes. The youngest player in program history is committed to Penn State. We'll talk about him and hear from our special guest about what it's like to be on the sidelines when recruits visit Beaver Stadium. Finally, our special guest, Joe Herman, will tell us about his favorite moments and top Big Ten towns. And we will close this week's edition with the listener mailbag. All right, Joe Hermit, welcome to the Penn Live Penn State Blitz video and podcast. This is not your first rodeo. You joined me one time last year when Bob was off, but how are things going and how excited are you for sports to return and football, especially to be back in the fall? Greg, I am dying for football. It is, uh, it's been a long, strange trip indeed, you know, I mean. By the way, live in the hermit bunker here in the uh, in the basement because that was the only quiet room I could find uh, this morning. Um, but uh, man, yeah, I'm, I'm counting down the days. I'm sure, as we all are. So let's set the scene for what a return will look like. As we record this on Wednesday morning, uh, June 10th, it is. Uh, there are 75 Penn State football players quarantining back in State College preparing to work out starting next week. Uh, next Monday, they will work out. The same day, President Eric Barron is supposed to deliver an address of some sort regarding what fall semester classes will look like and maybe even the return of uh, students for the second summer semester, which starts on July 1. So things are moving in the right direction here. We don't know which Penn State players are on campus. We don't know if any of them have been tested for the coronavirus yet, if any of them have tested positive. Penn State has not yet released any information on that, and they may not until next week. But Joe, I got to think from all of our perspectives as football fans and observers of this Penn State program, the fact that they are back on campus, at least in uh, some capacity, um, offers more hope for a season and an on-time season than I think any of us had, even maybe just a couple of weeks ago. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it's it, it's definitely a step in the right direction. I mean, you know, you see you saw some other schools uh, like down south already getting in, like Alabama, uh, although they had a couple of issues last week, I guess. But uh, I guess there are there will be bumps in the road, I'm sure, but. Um, you know, the fact that they are, have the majority of the squad on, on campus now, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's certainly a good sign and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, a, a step in the right direction. Yeah. And let's keep in mind too, that like we saw with the number of schools and the ones that come immediately to mind, Iowa state, Oklahoma state, Alabama, if and when Penn State releases its data in regards to testing players and staff coming back to campus, there will be some to test positive. The numbers almost guarantee it. Um, so it's not something to freak out over. Uh, Penn State, I'm sure, had to submit a plan that was approved by <laughs> any number of uh, legislative and bureaucratic uh, departments to even begin bringing uh, players back in small numbers, or in this case, at uh, 75. We don't know why they picked 75, but a part of that plan is what to do when somebody tests positive. And, and keep in mind as well that these workout groups, when they start working out next week, are going to be kept to probably five or ten guys at most. With the reason being that if someone does uh, contract the coronavirus in that group, they can then quarantine just those 10 guys and not all 75. So we'll see how things play out. Obviously, we don't know if uh, a gallery like Joe's faces in the crowd will be possible this year. We don't know if Beaver Stadium can have, you know, 10 percent of capacity, 25 percent of capacity, 50 percent of capacity. I mean, 100 percent capacity seems very unlikely at this point in time. But who knows? Like we said earlier uh in May, we weren't even sure how optimistic getting back to campus by this time, uh, you know, how possible that would be. And yet here we are uh, about midway through June with a number of schools across the country on campus, some schools waiting until July. But uh, things are certainly moving in the direction, Joe, that, that everybody would like them to. Of course, health and safety comes first. But, uh, you know, a football season is something I think a lot of America is looking forward to. And the NFL looks to be on track and now college football does, too. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, well, you know, all the things that we've gone through, you know, with the, the basketball season and the hockey season, uh, you know, and baseball never even getting started. Um, I just can't imagine, 
this country without football in the fall. I, I just, you know, it would just at some level anyway, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it certainly would be a refreshing change. Even, even if it were, you know, it'd be interesting to see how it's going to look, you know, I mean, with a, cause you know, we've been to blue white games and, and, and to, um, you know, stadiums that are maybe 25 or 50% full. And it is a really different feeling, but, uh, you know, some football is better than no football, right? Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. Some places are that full, not for health and safety reasons, but because it's actually bad for your health to watch some of those teams. So I know exactly what you're getting at there, Joe. And what a lot of people don't know is that Joe is the best backseat broadcaster of Phillies baseball uh, on the planet. And so he's still holding out hope for baseball. I'm sure many of you are as well. Doesn't look terribly encouraging, but I guess we'll see how that all plays out. Moving on to second down. Uh, Joe, you had a a couple of photos of him actually from the sideline. The youngest player, as far as I know, to ever commit to Penn State, Matthias Barnwell. He's a class of 2023 tight end. Um, He plays in Spotsylvania, Virginia. He's already 6'3", 230 pounds, if my memory serves me right. I mean, he's a big kid. Uh, Your photos show as much. If you haven't seen those, you can see him at PennLive.com slash Penn State football. But uh, he picks Penn State uh, two years at least before he can sign a national letter of intent. I can't ever remember a 15-year-old committing to Penn State. Maybe it's happened, but I, I don't think it has. They only, they're not even on the board yet for the class of 2022. But, Joe, can you take the listeners into the pregame festivities at Beaver Stadium and what you see when the recruits like Matthias Barnwell get to interact with James Franklin either at midfield or on the sideline before kickoff during warmups? Sure, Greg. Yeah, I think a lot of fans don't realize that there's like a whole orchestrated event going on with recruits at games, you know, I mean, because, you know, the games are the showpieces for for the university. I mean, they, you know, I mean, they could recruit these kids all they want, but until they get them on campus and get them into a, to the environment, you know, there's no way to really sell the experience. And Penn State certainly has a lot to sell there. And um so these kids, they bring these kids in and, you know, they, they, it's very, it's, it, 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 you know, it's very orchestrated. It's very well planned out. You know, they bring them, I have a spot for them outside where they bring them out as, you know, before the buses arrive and they, they plant them like right on the side there, right near the, right near the entrance to the building. And, you know, the team walks by, the band walks by, James comes up, shake hands with all of them, um, greets them all, and then, you know, and then, um, they bring them back out during pregame and uh, your, your bigger recruits that are on hand, they'll, they'll actually during pregame, James will be out at around the 50 yard line and they'll walk them out one by one or, you know, maybe groups of like two or three and they'll walk out and uh, James greets them, gives them a hug, talks to them, you know, oftentimes uh, they'll take a selfie, you know, with James at, in, at midfield and, um, you know, it really sells the experience, I think, you know, it really, they, Penn State really, um, I mean, they've got such a great product to sell and, you know, they really do a good job of, uh, of doing that, you know, taking, taking advantage of, of, of everything that they've got to, to show off, um, you know, and then after that, they bring them back down, um, line them up like right near the tunnel and, and the team actually, you know, comes out of the tunnel and runs right by them, you know, the band and the pageantry and everything, you know, it, it's such a huge selling point for a kid, I think. Um, and then, you know, after, after the team comes on the field, you know, they're escorted up into the stands where they sit pretty much right behind the bench with their families and, and get to watch the game. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm curious as to how <laughs> empty stadiums that we talked about earlier will affect recruiting because, um, you know, if there are no fans in the stands or if they're only, you know, a third full or whatever, it certainly it certainly affects the environment because um, it's it's it it will nearly be the same as like a sold out whiteout crowd, for instance. No. And I think that you'll have to pare it down. And I think a lot of kids will still leave visit saying, you know, even though you know, the crowd that was there was great. You know, we don't hear too many kids. um have negative experiences on game day visits because they're geared to being perfect. And I think that even with uh, a lower capacity crowd, you'll still get a lot of kids impressed by what they see at Penn state and other places. Um, I wonder how many recruits Penn state will even be able to host um, during this season. I mean, 
if the stadium is at 25 or 30 percent of capacity, it's going to have to include your recruiting crowd. So it's going to be very interesting. And as you as you mentioned, Joe, they sit in the stands right behind the Penn State bench. So whatever kind of social distancing is done in the stadium, assuming there's any fans and of course, no fans, there's no recruiting. Um it's going to be fascinating to see how they figure that out because I believe you're going to find a lot of situations where there are more kids that want to come to games than can come to games. So you're right. That uh, sort of pregame, uh, you know, uh, ceremony, I guess you could call it, or uh, interaction with James, even that's going to change. I mean, I don't think by the fall we're going to see uh, high school kids walk out and shake Coach Franklin's hand and then give him a hug. And you have so many pictures of kids doing just that. And I don't think that's going to be uh, something that's desirable or acceptable or uh, safe to do in the fall. So uh, we'll see how that changes things as well. But uh, just one other quick recruiting note, Caden Prather, a receiver out of uh, Maryland four-star picked West Virginia, shockingly uh, to a lot of people. Jarrett Parker, the former Penn State receivers coach, reels him in there as the offensive coordinator. Lions got some work to do now on the recruiting trail at receiver. They have Lonnie White Jr. They have Liam Clifford. Both could be receivers at the next level. But they were expected to have a couple four-stars in this group. Dante Thornton leaves them out of his top six. Prather picks West Virginia at least. Jaleel Farouk and maybe some Florida guys as options, but Taylor Stubblefield certainly has his work cut out for him more than we even expected that he would. And part of it's not his fault. He couldn't bring guys on campus for these big visits. And because of that, I think they went to places that they felt more comfortable with the coach that they probably met in person before. And a lot of these guys didn't have a chance to meet uh, Taylor Stubblefield in person yet or sit down with Kirk Sharaka and learn about his offense. So tough beat there. There's been some ups and downs on the recruiting trail of late, but uh, a lot of time left, obviously, before the first signing day in December. All right, this is the Penn Live Penn State Football Blitz. You can find the audio version, the podcast version, wherever you get your audio, uh, Spotify, Google, Apple, don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Leave us some feedback. Joe is uh, saying that his background doesn't look the best. So if you're watching the video, youtube.com slash all Penn State, subscribe there, lead some feedback, and uh, and let Joe know what you think of his backdrop as he sits in for Bob Flounders this week. Moving on to third down, Joe Hermit, we're going to put you on the spot. Tell me what it was like to photograph Allen Robinson's iconic catch uh, down the sideline. And tell me what it was like to photograph Saquon Barkley's uh, multiple leaping moments over his Penn State career. Yeah, that I mean, you're talking about you know two of the in my you know 20 years. I mean, I've been on the beat for 20 years now. It's been my 21st season. You're talking about two of the best guys, um, most you know fun to photograph guys that that have been. And there have been a lot of great players that have come through, but you know. You're, tra- you're definitely talking about the best running back and, you know, arguably the best wide receiver. And that, that um, you know, there are moments, there are definitely, there are moments in time that you remember in, in, in a season. And, like, I, I felt that the whiteout game against Michigan and, you know, Penn State being down and, and you know, trying to come back and and that play, that play just kind of, like, it was just almost like this to me, it was like the signature play of the season that year. I mean, it, it, I know it didn't win the game. It didn't even score a touchdown, but it was, it was such, it was such a a stunning play, a stunning factor in that game, you know, with, uh, you know, Christian Hackenberg just getting back and and dropping back and just letting that ball fly. And, and Allen Robinson just making an incredible, incredible catch. And, uh, it's one of my favorite photos, and, and not not just because of the action of the photo, but I mean the, the the fact that you can see the crowd, like everybody in the background, people on the sidelines, people in the crowd, everybody just like looking up at, at is he going to make this play? Oh my God, he's going is he going to catch this ball? Uh-huh. And I just remember that the, the stadium just erupting. You know, I mean, as you know, Greg, you've been to a lot of whiteouts, and it's an incredible experience. But when something like that happens in a whiteout, um, you know, I think at the Tom Bahali sack against Ohio State, there are a few moments that stick out that are even, you know, that 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 make those moments even bigger. Um, and that certainly was one of them. No question about it. How do you get the shots that you do, Joe? What's one or two of the keys? Uh, you know, we see you right down the sideline. 
Uh, you know, uh, obviously sometimes Jordan Stout kicks kickoffs at you and you try and catch them. But uh, just give us a little bit of an insight into the last 20 years of photography, what that's been like to be on the sideline and how you get the shots you do. Um, yeah, it's a lot of luck. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of football, always have been, you know, so I do know the game a bit. So, you know, I, I kind of that 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 definitely helps a lot. Um, you know, and the more you cover a team, the more you're around a team, the more you kind of recognize some tendencies and you kind of get some feelings and, and position yourself uh, where you, accordingly where you think it might be going, the next play or something might be going. I do a lot of research. I do study. You know, I study up on the teams that you know, that, are, that are coming up, you know, some of the key players, some of, you know, their strengths and weaknesses, um, you know, and, and that and that definitely helps. Um, and, you know, I always I always as a rule, stay, stay in front of Penn State. You know, Penn State's always coming toward me, you know, when a big play happens or something. Um, you know, I've got the Penn State players because that's what our readers and our fans are, are, are interested in. Um, and, and, you know, uh, faces make for, for great photos. So backs of helmets don't necessarily. So, you know, it definitely helps to be in front so they're coming toward you. And, and you know, emotion and reaction and... Um, uh, you know, that all comes into play when, you know, when when you're in front and the team's coming towards you. Yeah, Joe, that makes a lot of sense. Obviously, um, you know, to get the shots that you do, there's skill involved as well. Also, you know, some luck. I get that, too. But, um, you know, it's uh, you have a lot of iconic photos over the years. So let's just jump into the mailbag here quickly to wrap things up. Um, tell us the one shot you have take. you know, you have off the field that you like the most, whether it's uh, coach Franklin with his daughters, whether it's the blue band, whether it's the team arrival, give us one off field moment that's memorable and why. Ooh, good question. Um, I would have to say probably my favorite non-action photo that comes to mind would be um, after the 2016 uh, Ohio state game, the, the whiteout win, the improbable, uh, you know, comeback win um you know all the, the players are celebrating going crazy i'm kind of photographing james franklin and some of the players and you know i i, I noticed that fans are starting to spill out onto the field so i take off and i run down toward the student section and i you know out of the corner of my eye i you know i see cornerback uh john reed and this this girl come running and leap into his arms <laughs> and you know so i i, I tear off running over there and and you know it, it's just this photo of it's just like pure joy you know i mean she he's standing there holding his helmet in one hand and holding her in the other she's got she's like got she's just wrapped around him kissing him and and uh you know in the background the fans are kind of spilling out of the, uh, the stands onto the field you know it, it almost kind of reminded me of that that classic photo you know after uh, you know the end of the war in times square with the sailor you know um but uh yeah, that you know, there've been a lot of great, great moments, but that's the one that really comes to mind for me. And you know, funny story, real quick. Uh, I, you know, a number of years later, a couple of years later, uh, uh, this 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 girl comes up to me and and says, "Hey, you, Joe Herman?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." And she's like, uh, "She's like, oh, I just, you know, I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to thank you. You know, um, I'm John Reed's girlfriend, and and uh, I was in that photo that you took after the Ohio State game, and, and you know, it was an incredible moment, and." I got the photo and, and you know, it, it's framed on my wall and, you know, I'm going to treasure that forever. And, you know, and so that's pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty cool when you can um, have a photo that that affects someone like that. And, you know, it's going to be kind of an iconic image for, uh, you know, for years to come. There you go. Well, I think you have certainly earned it. And thank you all for listening to this week's edition. We will be back next week. I think we'll have a special guest again. It won't be Joe. It'll be somebody else. But until then, enjoy the rest of the week and have a good weekend.